Agency. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's not every day that uh, somebody in my field comes up on stage and says, hey, I have a new breakthrough to tell you about in my own field, but I do. And today I'm going to describe to you a new family of uh, consensus protocols that uh, just emerged about a month ago. A mysterious pseudonymous team calling themselves Team Rocket dropped this particular paper that I will tell you about. And in the space of the next 15 minutes, I want to outline for you exactly how this protocol works. I know all of you will leave this room knowing exactly how it works. And that's a very tall order. No other consensus protocol I know of is as simple to reason about as what I'm about to show you. And it has some amazing properties. But before I do all this, let me try to put everything in perspective. So in my field of distributed systems, uh, the, there are only two existing families of consensus protocols. Consensus, of course, being the, one of the most important protocols that we, uh, we have to use when we have multiple machines that have to agree on something, like account balances, how much you have, who gave how much money to whom. So to this end, people worked really, really hard over the course of the last 40 years or so, and, uh, and they developed two families. The first one is the, is the family of protocols that we call classical consensus protocols. These were developed by two greats in my field, uh, Leslie Lamport and Barbara Liskov. Both of them have Turing Awards. And uh, these systems are incredibly good in the sense that they achieve quick finality. And... Uh, they, uh, they can guarantee very, very quickly that a transaction that you submitted has taken place. So that's a wonderful feature. But they uh, do not scale well. They require quadratic communication among the people who are, who are participating. And they require that you know everybody in the system that is supposed to participate in the decision. Their security comes down to judicious overlap between quorums of people who say, yes, I saw this, and yes, I know you saw it, and now I can uh, go ahead and commit something. So this is a good basis when you want to build a permissioned blockchain, but it is not a good basis when you don't know who should be in your system. Like we could not use it in this room because we don't all agree on exactly who's in the room. Right? There are new people coming in that I know about that you might not know about, and suddenly those overlaps break down and it becomes really hard to use this. That's why it has been used for all the permissioned uh, blockchains that, uh, that uh, have adopted them, but not useful for permissionless uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, another family appeared on the scene, as you all know, in 2009. Satoshi Nakamoto came up with his protocol family, and his brilliant solution was fantastic in one major way. That is, it was robust. You did not all have to know who was in the system. Any miner could pop up at any point. Any miner could come up with a block and participate in the system. And that's wonderful. The problems, of course, are that Nakamoto consensus is slow. For Bitcoin, you have to wait at least 10, maybe 60 minutes before you have some assurance that your transaction is on the chain. They're also limited in throughput. So Bitcoin gets about three to seven transactions per second, which is not at all enough to handle uh, the, the task of being a world currency. And, uh, and of course, uh, the biggest, biggest problem now, right now is that Bitcoin consumes an enormous amount of energy approximately equal to two Denmarks. And if you want to visualize uh, how, what that really means, I'm sure everybody has seen nuclear power plants. I'm sure many of you can recall uh, how Chernobyl looked. So four of those, okay? So four Chernobyls go into uh, powering Bitcoin. And uh, that is a lot of energy spent on bookkeeping. And that energy also comes with payments. So to actually maintain that energy, you have to constantly mint money and give it to the miners. There is this ecosystem of miners, and uh, we're uh, sending money over to them hand over fist. So now, what about this new thing? Well, about a month ago, this paper dropped. And this paper has an amazing new feature. It combines the best of both worlds. It combines the best of Nakamoto with the best of classical consensus. So it gives you quick finality and very low latency, about two seconds across the globe for finality. That, after two seconds, you know your payment is done. You're at the checkout counter, you're done, you're out of there. It gives you high throughput, thousands of transactions per second. It scales very easily from 10,000 nodes on up to maybe 10 million nodes. 
and uh, it's robust. We don't have to all agree on, on uh, who all is in the system. Imagine it as a system that we could actually use here or in a very crowded, ginormous stadium. You and I don't have to necessarily agree on the precise members of that stadium to actually come to, uh, come to undeniable consensus. And most importantly, it's a quiescent protocol. It's uh, green, it's sustainable, there's no mining, and there is no special ecosystem of miners with their own separate interests from the users. Those of you with a distributed systems background, I can tell you how this works in a couple of sentences. It's inspired by gossip protocols, which go under the name of epidemics. And, uh, but, uh, uh, so anyway, so that's sort of, a, it gives you a sense of what it does. And deep down, the new idea here is metastability. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a protocol that is designed to tip. The worst thing you want for a consensus protocol is for it to be stable in the middle. You don't want that. You want it to say either this happened or that happened. You want it to fall to one of the two sides. And the core operation is so darn simple, as I promised you, that I can just illustrate it to you. It's very simple. We are in a very big crowded, uh, crowded stadium. We don't know who's in it. Um, but uh, we start out, we look around, we pick a small number of people around the stadium, yeah, five of them, let's say, somewhere between you know, five to 10 will do. And then we poll them, we say, look, uh, you know, you, A, B, C, D, E, what do you think? What shall we pick, red or blue? And these nodes then will respond. They can say red, red, blue, red, blue. When we see this, we go, okay, it looks like the entire stadium is tilting towards red, at least from my own perspective, based on one round of polling. And so what I'm going to do now is simply add my weight to what I perceive to be the heavier weight. So I'll throw my weight behind the red after this poll. It's dirt simple. Now this uh, uh, repeats itself for everybody else. You do the same, you do the same, and so on and so forth. And you can see that even if we start out in the worst possible scenario of a 50-50 split stadium, after one round, we're not going to be at 50-50. The chances of that are astronomically small. After two rounds, even smaller. After three, it's just we're talking about probabilities so low that it's more likely that your phone will misbehave and miscompute that then uh, you will stay at 50-50. We will go from a 50-50 split to a 51-49 split, more, most likely. And after a 51-49 split, we're going to find ourselves in a bigger split, 53-47, uh, and so on and so forth. This thing is designed to tip. It's not going to stay in the middle. And as it tips, as more and more people shift to one color or the other, we're going to have a, a, a first a phase change. So the speed with which we move towards one direction is going to increase and increase. And at some point, we're going to reach the point of no return where the entire stadium either has red cards on top of their foreheads or blue cards. That's very, very simple. You did not have to read pages and pages of uh, uh, obscure uh, mathematical proofs to understand the intuition behind why this works. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we have the low latency of this kind of a protocol. We have the scalability of this kind of a loose, uh, lightweight uh, mechanism. But there are also other things that, uh, that come, come with this. This can tolerate a large percentage of Byzantine participants with no impact on safety. You can have up to 50% of the people actually be Byzantine. They, sometimes they say blue, sometimes they say uh, red to try to pull people back and to try to keep the entire thing in, in, uh, in balance. But they will be unable uh, to, to do this uh, in a way that causes two people to decide on two separate things. The system, the ecosystem this gives rise to is egalitarian. There are no miners, there's no mining, it's green. And you can participate via your cell phone if you want. Now, those of you who are in the audience who've been conditioned to think you can never have a free lunch uh, will say, well, what's the catch? Okay, here is the catch, and I think it's a great catch to have. The catch is there is no liveness guarantee for conflicting transactions. So if I spend some money to give to you and I spend the same money to give to her, then the system may be unable to decide between these two. Now, classical consensus would have decided. Nakamoto would have decided. He would have picked one or the other. We may not, and it's okay. I tried to defraud the two of you, and I got stuck with my funds in the middle. Who's affected? I'm affected. Is the system affected? No. 
So that's a wonderful thing to have, and I think it, this, the distributed system space is in general a space where you try to correl some badness across the different bins you've got. And in this case, all of the badness ends up on the shoulders of the person who tried to defraud. And that's, uh, that's a very, very good uh, uh, mechanism to have. I want to tell you a little bit about the new token we're going to be building on top of this mechanism. It's a very, very neat mechanism. Once again, the core idea was subsampled voting. I've sampled, sample, sample, sample. After about 13 rounds, I look around and we've all decided. That's a pretty cool thing. Now, what are we going to do? Uh, one of the first things we want to build with this is a new native token. We call it AVA, short for Avalanche. And, uh, and so AVA is going to support all of those things that you are familiar with supporting. Uh, but it will also support the creation of additional, additional coins. We believe very much in sharding across function. So there will be AVA, the native token, and there might be other tokens that people can create on top, for example, for real estate, for example, for other assets that they might want to support. It is also possible to take AVA and layer it on top of an existing system. So we could take the UTXO set from, from Bitcoin, from Ethereum, from Zcash, or whatever else, and put it on top. Or in fact, layer AVA on the existing system so that the miners use Avalanche to get pre-consensus on what's about to go into the blocks. So if you want very, very quick confirmations in Bitcoin Cash, well, this is one way to achieve it. So, uh, okay, so then there are other questions. How do you ensure that there are no sibyls? How do I push people back? Like if somebody wants to create a gazillion accounts, very simple. Uh, we require that the participants put up some stake to show that they have some ownership in the system. That stake will never go away. Unlike Ethereum and other systems your st where your stake might be at risk if you misbehave, there is no risk of your money going away. Okay, so the, the, the stake is there solely to make sure that you don't get to pretend to be more than one person. The uh, staking also allows us to do minting. We don't have designated miners. What we do have is people who have enough money uh, can actually uh, build on, on top of the stake that they've put up. And um, so that's an interesting thing, and that takes me to my final point. And it's an interesting point, and probably one of the coolest things that, uh, that this whole entire system gives us, which is governance. The core idea here was sampled voting and the ability to make progress, the ability to reach consensus when there is consensus to be had in the audience. So we can use that mechanism to agree on critical parameters of the protocol itself. So for example, we can say things like, look, at the moment we don't have enough stakers, we should increase the minting rate so as to get more nodes into the system. Or vice versa, you can say, well, the price is crashing. Let's reduce the minting rate so as to, to boost the price and reduce the, the supply of coins. In contrast, Nakamoto had to come up with his, with his 21 million uh, minting curve. And he got it somewhat right for some periods of time. It's incredibly wrong for other periods. There were times when the Bitcoin uh, price crashed through the, the, the bottom. And there were times when the price mooned. Sure, that was very nice, maybe. Uh, but that is not, uh, you know, that happened by accident, essentially, the, uh, where the demand exceeded uh, his supply curve. What we have here instead is essentially a crowd oracle, a way to get rid of the central bank and to, to replace it with people who have a vested interest in seeing the, uh, the coin managed properly and for their own interests. So, uh, so, okay, where does that take us? In summary... What, what happens in these circles is people often talk about Bitcoin and other currencies and consensus protocols in general as if they were a way to poll the audience for what they think. But they're not. In Bitcoin, the decisions are made by the miners. Okay? So um, in contrast, in Avalanche, it is directly based on sampling the audience. And there is a very direct tie in between users and their decisions. So this new family is perfectly suited as the basis for a new currency, a new communication mechanism, and as a, a, and a, and a contract platform between businesses. So, um, of course, we realize, or I realize, that the, one of the most important things about any currency is its community. And one of the things that we're going to be trying to do in the next year or so is to uh, spring up communities that are interested in developing on this technology and building on top of a brand new platform that has some uh, huge, big technical insights and technical progress compared to everything that exists today. Thank you very much.